Welcome to Computer Repair Podcast, episode number 306, Taking Care of Business. I'm your host, Jeff Alch. This is our live show where we discuss the ins and outs of running your computer repair business. Our show today is brought to you by Instant House Call, remote support that is easy for you and your customers to use. This is a must-have tool with features like on-demand for your break-fix customers and unattended for managed services. You can do automatic repairs with the auto repair built-in software, and it will save you time and money when you are supporting your customers. Check it out for a free trial at instanthousecall.com. Use the offer code PODNUTS. And also buy FreshBooks, the simple pain-free invoicing solution for freelancers and small business owners. For a 30-day free trial, just go to freshbooks.com forward slash PODNUTS. Enter PODNUTS in the How Did You Hear About Us section. Let me introduce the co-host. We have Dave Greenbaum from uh, Dr. Dave Computer Repair, right? Yep, absolutely. How you doing, man? Pretty good, pretty good. How are you, Jeff? I am doing excellent. Awesome. And uh, excited to bring this topic and everything. We had uh, a little bit of a technical snafu. Uh, maybe we'll go into that in the tips and tricks section, but let's go ahead and start with that. And guess what? Since you're my only co-host this week, I'm going to throw it over to you. So, Tip or story of the week. Tip or story of the week. Your choice. Uh, I'll, t- I'll tell a story. It was an interesting one. You probably heard about the tech support scams. We've all had clients face them. Um, go ahead and say they're calling from Microsoft or something like that. Get taken for a bunch of money. Had a client have this happen, but it had an interesting twist in the middle and the end. Um, we convinced him, don't take any phone calls from anyone that isn't Dr. Dave. He got that. He got that really well. And he told the scammers, I'm not going to talk to you. I will only talk to Dr. Dave. So a couple days later, you won't guess who called him claiming to be Dr. Dave, the scammers. They said, we are from Dr. Dave and we are here to help. And he proceeded to want to pay them several thousand dollars, but he was smart. This is the funny thing. He was smart. He's like, I'm not going to give my credit card over the phone to you. I'm going to go to the bank and I'm going to give Dave the money directly. So next thing I know, I get a call from the bank. Um, we've got a gentleman here who wants to transfer $3,000 into your bank account. Um, this sounds a little bit fishy. Should we go ahead? And I'm like, absolutely not. Then he calls me and says, I'm trying to slip a check under your door and I can't find your office. Like, what are you doing? Why are you trying to give me money? And then he explains to me, well, you've been calling me and you've been charging me for all this computer help. And I said, it was not me. What, you know, what, look at your caller ID. What number are they calling from? They were calling from my number. They spoofed my number. Oh my gosh. Yep. Cause once he said, I get it. That's part of the scam. Once he said, I will only accept calls from Dr. Dave. He signaled the scammers. All we have to do is pretend to be Dr. Dave. And we've got this guy for the money. But I guess he was smart in the end by not actually giving a credit card number over the phone. So fortunately, he wasn't taking for any money. But boy, howdy, does that scare you realizing that a scammer is pretending to be you? It's only going to get worse out there, right? I mean, that's just kind yeah. of the way things are going. It's uh, it's unfortunate. Wow. Well, so that- yeah, that was, I could have gotten $3,000 for doing absolutely <laughs> nothing, but I'm an ethical person. Well, you know, here's the thing, too. A lot of people will look at this and you know, I always laugh at the people out there that go, Oh, my customers won't pay me X amount of dollars. You have the wrong customers, find the right customer. That's willing to pay you no matter what. And guess what? I've had customers that have paid scammers exorbitant fees in the hundreds of dollars, not thousands, but hundreds. And you're kind of like, and then you feel bad for charging a hundred bucks or $200. It's, it's kind of ridiculous. Really? It is. It is. All right, so my tip of the week, something I discovered, and I'm going back to a little nostalgia here, and that is we've talked about to-do lists. We've talked about how they don't work. You can have them on your phone. Let me put it this way, how they don't work for me. If a to-do list works for you, by all means, go ahead and do that. Whatever's going to work. All of our brains are wired differently, and so we need to figure out a way that's going to work for us. One of the things I discovered is I went back to using post-it notes. Why? Because for me, when I take one note and jot it down and stick it to the top of my desk, 
I don't like clutter. As most people can see the inside of my office, I, it's not usually cluttered. It's usually everything has its order. Everything's in place. So when there's these post-it notes that are stuck to my desk, I'm constantly looking at them every time I'm sitting down and then I might grab one and take care of it or keep going until it gets to the point where I'm, I want to clear all these post-it notes off of my desk. Now you could put them on your computer or anything, but to me, that would be blasphemy. So I just don't want to stick anything on my computer monitor. <laughs> I want it to be open and free because I want to use it, but it's annoying enough that it makes me actually look at them and deal with them. And plus it gets my ideas and things that I need to do out of my head that are not scheduled, but need to be done in a short period of time onto a piece of paper that I don't have to worry about and I can take care of it, crumple it up. Yes, it's probably a little expensive to do that. But like I said, for me, to-do lists just do not work because I can take the pad of paper, I can shove it off to the side, I can throw it on a shelf and out of sight, out of mind, it's just not the way for me to go. So I'm going to continue to use post notes so I can get things done. Plus when I'm talking to somebody, usually on the computer or somewhere close to my computer, the post notepads right there, I can just grab something. Now, obviously if you're away from your desk, you're going to have to put it, uh, you know, in some sort of note taking app via your phone, uh, iPad or, or whatever you're carrying around with you, laptop, et cetera. But at least if I've really got to get something done, I can always transfer it from that to a post-it note. I know it's kind of backwards thinking, but yeah, you got to find something that's going to work for you. Now, do you organize them at all the way you put them out there? Are they the same color, same rank, any other organization systems besides just post-its? That's a good question. So what I will do is not really organization, but what I found myself doing is, yeah, they're all the same color because I'm not going to, I just, whatever post-it notepad I have available right now, they're orange. And I'll grab them and jot numbers down. Now, what I will do is because they are sticky is depending on the order, I will usually put the ones that need to be taken care of closest to my keyboard <laughs> or closest to me. And so I might switch things around and go, yeah, I need to take care of this. This one I need to take care of later, et cetera. But that's about as far as my organization goes. I think it's a good system. If it works for you, by all means, there's a lot of people who do systems like that. I, I forget, you know, this comes from the life hacker days. There was, um, I think there's a specific Japanese system, I forget what's called, that uses these cards and organizes them in a certain way for your tasks. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd have to Google it, but yeah. Okay. So you're not you're not totally off the mark with that. It's a it's an ancient system that still works. Yep. And yeah, and like you said, it's one of those things you just gotta figure out what's gonna work for you, what's gonna make you because everything else, I don't know about your business, Dave, but everything else in my business I will put down on a calendar. Like when I have to edit the podcast or I have to, I have a customer appointment or whatever that might be, even down to the point of sleeping, getting up for work, all these things are in my actual schedule. So what it does in my calendars, it blocks out those, those times because even as, as organized as we can be, sometimes I will find myself to where I'm sitting down and it seems like I have extra time, but I have nothing put into that slot. So it's just kind of a, sometimes a lot of times actually a wasteful time. And I need to, I need to be better at using my time effectively. In other words, if I know I need to get something done at six o'clock, but I'm sitting down at four o'clock, it's okay to start that task at four and get done early and then go on. Cause what ends up happening is something else will happen and I won't do that task or whatever needs to be done. And it'll get put off to the next day, which doesn't help anybody out. And it weighs on your brain. I don't care who you are. It just weighs, it weighs on your mind big time. Absolutely. Yeah. I use kind of the uh, one, three, five method, one major tasks, three mediocre tasks and five small tasks that all, I all try to get done at the day. I start the day with that. I may not get through it all, but at least the next day I go back to that list and say, okay, that's, that's my punching order for the day. One big task, three medium tasks, five very small tasks. So if I've got a few minutes to kill, let me just get one of those fivers done real quick. Now, as far, okay, so what would be considered a big task in that hierarchy? Um, closing out the month. Okay. My big task today, closing out um, December's books, closing out the whole year would be a different thing, but like five tasks, the small tasks are email these various people. 
like go ahead and order this product on Amazon or something like that. And then probably medium tasks would be write a blog article. You know, generally a medium task is about 15 minutes. A big task is, is about an hour or two. And the, the fivers are five minute tasks. Okay. I like that. That's yeah. good. Just kind of look at that list every day and just kind of move things around. That's very good. Yeah. I'm going to have to, uh, might incorporate that, incorporate that into my post-it notes. Maybe you get one big post-it note <laughs> over to the side and the threes and the fives. <laughs> As long as I'm grabbing them when I can and taking care of them and then throwing them out, then I'm, I'm perfectly happy. So got to have a system. Yep. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and talk about what's coming up this year. And that is TechCon Unplugged. Woo! September 20th through the 22nd, 2019 in Grand Rapids, Michigan, not too far from my house, actually about two and a half hours, but not too far. And, uh, Here's what you're going to get for the $199 ticket. All right. You're going to get all your meals and snacks at the event because we want you to be well fed, well taken care of, got your thinking cap on, and able to process the information that's coming at you. Number two, you're going to have dinner at Dave and Buster's along with a game card to enjoy activities. So, really, all your meals are taken care of other than, you know, snacks outside the event, et cetera, et cetera, driving to and fro or, you know, taking a plane ride and eating your packet of peanuts. But other than that, the other thing that you're going to get is good, wholesome IT content with community invested vendors. And that's what we're looking for is vendors out there that are interested in the business, in your business, no matter how small you are. They want, we want people to come together, not only from a community standpoint, but from the vendor standpoint and be able to help each other out because obviously, in order for vendors to be around, we want them to get paid. And in order for us to be around, we want community invested vendors that are going to help take care of us and make our lives easier when it comes to supporting our customers. So that's what we're looking to do. I'm excited. It's going to be a great time. And go and get your tickets now. Get your hotel room. It's $102 a night. It's can't get no cheaper than that. Free parking. Go to techconunplugged.com. Get your tickets today, and we'll be looking forward to seeing you there. All right. So, Dave, we're going to talk about a topic that you brought, and you brought me a, uh, a whole note of, of the kind of things you've been going through. But here's how I summarize this whole thing, and then I'm going to let you kind of take point and just go with it. Sure. And that is, how do you measure your business to know if you're going in the right direction? And I think those are some of the things that you were talking about but obviously we're going to get into a lot more detail. So go ahead and, and tell us your thought process and where do you want to start with this conversation? Sure. Well, it really started with, you know, I've been in business for 15 years. I'm not the primary breadwinner in my house. And there are times where you're like, am I successful or am I not successful? Okay. I can pay the bills. I'm making money. We're not, you know, credit cards are being paid on time. The mortgage is paying on time, but am I successful? How am I going to define that success? And how am I going to grow as a business? And I read a book that really spoke to me. And it was Profit First by Mike McCowitz. And I've heard him speak before. And I read that I was like, wow, this, this makes a lot of sense. And what the primary focus is, is as it says, profit first, before you do anything, before you pay any bills, takes a little bit of money off the top and put it aside. Um, and it, I, I can't to like eat your dessert first. We're adults. We can eat our dessert first. And what it started doing is I started realizing it helps you measure your success. It helps keep you focused and it prevents you from burning out. Here's this money you've got set aside. That's fun money. This is your profit. This is your dividends. This is extra to everything else that comes right off the top. Every service call, every dollar that comes in, a certain amount of that goes to profit first. And then there's a lot more details behind that. But wow, it's like that is a really great idea and really putting off your money aside for that. So saying, OK, well, I can go on vacation. We've got the money to do that. But is it because of my business or is it because of something else in the household? Is our investments doing well? What's going on? So it's just that idea of every dollar that comes in having it all kind of, I, and I kind of use some computer analogies, having different partitions for your money to start off with. 
a certain amount of money goes here, but a certain amount of money goes to that profit, the stuff for you, the stuff that makes your job worth doing. That's good. And I think a lot of people forget about that is the having, if you have profit in your business and it's, um, it's there, but you don't know how much is really there because you've kind of lumped everything into one lump sum and you're paying bills and you're kind of seeing what you have extra. And then you go in and basically sell something or you make a profit. You don't know exactly what you have left. You go to, you go to pay a bill and all of a sudden you think, Oh, I got the money here. I'm going to go ahead and pay this bill. And then next thing you know, you turn around and you go, wait a minute, I got these other things I got to get done and you don't have the money for it. And you're like going, so I think in this bit, not just in this business, but being an entrepreneur, you are constantly chasing your tail when you're not separating that stuff out. So it's, uh, it's one of those things that you have to look at and really define what it is and what makes it, I don't know, what, what makes it good to be in business and makes it worthwhile. Because a lot of times you're going, man, why am I doing this? I could go get a job and punch a clock and I have to worry about all this. Exactly. Stuff. Exactly. No, I don't know about you, but I, I mean, I have an accountant that does my taxes. I, I can go into QuickBooks and look at my profit and loss statement. I can okay. do that about as well as my average client can read event viewer. It's gotcha. all gobbledygook to me. I mean, okay, so it says I have money. What what does that mean? And then so many businesses I work with say, well, if you've got profit, you should reinvest it in your business. And and to an extent that's that's true, but if you start doing that, you're on this constant treadmill and going just more profit, grow the business, grow until you basically can't do it anymore and you're just exhausted and you burn out. And I see a lot of people in our industry do that. It's like, I got to grow my business. I got to grow my business. It keeps growing. It's growing. It's growing. I can't handle it anymore. And then start compressing it. What if you started off at some point saying, you know what, a certain amount, I'm not going to reinvest in the business and grow. I'm going to keep that for myself and enjoy life while I still can. And that, like I said, that really spoke to me. And, and there are a lot of things about different ways of doing it as far as cutting expenses, stuff like that. But the basic concept is right off the top, before you do anything, keep a little money for yourself. You know, and so we're going to, because there's so many different ways we could go with this. We're going to go off on a little bit of a tangent because I just got done sitting down with my wife and we basically did our budget, which, so shame on us. We only do it once a year. <laughs> And, and the reality is we're, you know, we're using a, we, we went to a cash system. So we're using an envelope system where basically every week you pull X amount out of the bank, you're taking that money and you're putting in envelopes for things that you're going to spend during the year. And you have to kind of put everything from medical expenses to uh, Christmas gifts to birthday gifts, et cetera, et cetera. You know, school, all this stuff, you have to have that separate thing, food. There's a big one because what ends up happening is a lot of times we overspend. And the other thing too, is I think you need to assess this stuff on a regular basis, which we have a plan implemented now to look at this stuff on a weekly basis versus waiting once a year to do this humongous budget and take four or five hours to put it together and then not look at it and go, man, I don't remember putting this in here last year. Do you? <laughs> no. Well, we do it when we're doing our taxes. You know, this is a time of year people start thinking about it. You get all your paperwork together and all that and you're like whoa especially for you know the small business owners like ourselves it's like oh now i gotta pay my estimated taxes and i gotta do this like where am i gonna get this money from oh my gosh it it, it all starts hitting you and this is the time where you say okay i'm gonna start the year off I'm really start looking at this stuff differently and one of the things now profit first is it doesn't use the the envelope message but it uses something similar it says even though it seems like a pain in the butt, create completely separate bank accounts for all this stuff. Um, have a bank account for the profit, have a bank account for the marketing, have a bank account for your taxes and keep them separate places and move money back and forth. And he says, and the most important thing is that profit account, keep it at, out of reach, make it at the most inconvenient bank possible. So you can't take money out of it because all of a sudden you're like, oh, I got to pay this bill. I got to pay this bill. Well, I've got this money sitting, as you said, the envelope. One of the concepts is you don't take money out of one envelope and put it into the other envelope. It stays there. So it's the same type of thing. It's so tempting to say, you know what? 
we won't do profit this month because there's this really great opportunity or I really want to buy this for the business or something like that. And you start taking money out of that. And once you start touching that, some of those accounts and moving money from one envelope to another, you've broken the entire system. And I think one of the simple ways to probably do that, and a lot of people may or may not know this, but when you get, when you open up a bank account, you don't have to get the little plastic card that they give you with it. Or even if they, even if they do automatically, you can cut that thing up so that you have to physically go into, go into the bank during operating hours, nine to five, in order to do a transaction instead of using a card or an ATM or whatever to pull money out, you don't have to do that. And that keeps it out of reach. And even if it's a local bank, it's still a pain to get in your car, drive down there, and you're going to double think what you're doing if you go to try to do that anyways. You're going to be like, no, I shouldn't do that. But if you make it too easy on yourself, it's it's easy, like Dave said, just to whip the card out and go, yeah, I'm going to pay this or, you know, even even checks. Just because you have a checking account doesn't mean you have to have checks to write against anything unless you're paying bills out of that. That's probably really the only account that you should be able to write checks or use an ATM card. The rest of it, the money should sit in there until you need to pull it out to pay your taxes, to pay your profit, all that stuff. Yep, I've got mine in an online bank account. Um, it has no checks, no ATM card. The only way I can take out money is to transfer it to another account, which takes, they say, three to five days. I only do it once a year. But yeah, it's all online. And the nice thing is the transfers from my main bank account are all automatic as well. Nice. That's a good point. I didn't even think about that. Using an online bank, that's you can do that from anywhere in the world, right? Yep. Better interest rates. And I just, I can't walk in. There's, unless I have the ATM card, there is no, and I just, I think, I think they sent me one and I ripped it up. But I also, even if I got one, I wouldn't know the pin. So okay. I want to be able to use it. <laughs> it's useless. <laughs> you can only take out so much money from an ATM at once anyway. So. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. all that, all th those main accounts are are online. Yeah, um, yeah, but yeah, and then you know, and and then you mentioned you kind of mentioned scheduling. That's the other thing that I see a lot of times. You know, it's kind of funny for those of us who do business clients and don't collect a time of service. It's like, okay, checks are cut on the first and the fifteenth or the fifteenth and thirtieth. You'll get your check when when are. But when people expect us to pay bills, we don't have that same schedule. We just, the bill comes in, you wait, you say, I don't have the money right now. No, you do the same thing. You pay your bills on a regular schedule to all your vendors. And if a, if a bill comes due a little bit early, you know, you don't, you don't have time to pay that right now. Um, you just, and th that gets the regularity going, like you say, with the, with the envelope method, that's how much money is in that account. And then you start going, wait a minute, I don't have enough money to pay that person on the 15th. I, I got to retool something in my business. And again, that, that that temptation of, oh i'll just take it up from from another account no no you can't do that you're not running your business right if you start moving money back and forth you're not really being successful you're just shuffling decks on the titanic <laughs> that's a it's a great analogy i don't yeah. know well it's kind of a sad analogy but <laughs> it's true <laughs> point <laughs> I think one uh, thing that also did it for me was once i started doing this i started really looking at my expenses closely every little expense. I was like, should I be paying money for that? Um, once a year now, I kind of make it a rule, of, especially with my technology bills, like my um, phone bill and my internet bill. Once a year, you call these companies up and you say, I'm paying too much, what you got going for me. And most of the time they've got some kind of deal going, you just have to call them. And then people are like, well, I don't have time to wait on hold half an hour, 45 minutes. Yeah, my, my secret is either do it while I'm at the gym working out, put on a little earpiece, you're fine. Uh, or while I'm driving, there's times where I'm driving 30 minutes to a client or something. And I make the rule, if I can't negotiate a better rate by the time I get to the client, I hang up. So, you know, that's a good point. And it, here's a, okay, so the even the people that complain, even if you had to sit your, at your desk and make a phone call, the reality is, and I'll give you a prime example. I just, I was paying 200, well over $225 for my internet. Now everybody goes, oh, you got everything. No, I have like the fastest internet I could get to my house via Comcast. And I have the basic uh, digital package for television of which none of it we watch. Everything we watch is on Netflix, Hulu, et cetera. Some sort of streaming service. So the reality is I went from $225 a month 
down to 118. That's over a hundred dollar savings. I'm a month. That's I'm sorry. That's twelve hundred dollars a year. If you don't have time to negotiate something for yourself, then I, you need to find something else to do. Because the reality is, you need to take that time and not pay these. You know, we, we've got to pay our bills. We've got to pay these prices sometimes. But it, it's always good to cu- try to cut that stuff down. Because exactly as you said, Dave, they there are deals out there. They give new customers deals all the time to try to steal from their, uh, you know, their competition. All we're doing, we're just playing the game. It's just like taxes. Everybody kind of goes, oh, you know, we all got, you know, ta- tax breaks and this and that. Yeah. And guess what? I take advantage of every one of them. Here's another thing. If you're actually paying your taxes, I don't know, in the state of Michigan, I have a 15% self-employment tax on top of every other tax that I already pay through my job and other things. It's, that turns out to be a lot. 15%, that's a lot. Most people that are employed don't see that because they only pay the seven and a half percent try paying the whole 15 oh yeah no if you're a sole proprietor you have to do that but that brings up a, one of the other points that is isn't directly mission and, and profit first but i'm uh, but i'm seeing this in our industry is if you're doing this as your primary job you got to be saving for retirement and you got to be doing that early some of that money you know that 15%, part of that's going to your social security. Your employer pays part of that. You pay part of that. But when you're the employer, you got to be given to your social security and your accountant says, oh, the, the best way to do this is pay as little money as possible for your business, show as little profit as possible. So you have to pay less self-employment tax. Awesome. And then when you get older, you're like, oh, I have nothing in social security saved up. Uh-oh, I screwed up. So you got to start either a, a self-employment pension, an SEP, or something like that. That money has to come out because you're going to get burned about 20, 30 years from now, depending on your age, if you don't have a primary W-2 job. Right, exactly. And we have uh, Paco LeBron from Prodigy Text joining us. Paco, how you doing? Better than good, better than most. Good to have hey, you, man. Paco. Paco decided to jump in and I didn't let everybody know, but I'll go ahead and let them know. Now, John is on an emergency, uh, not really an emergency, but he had to get something done today in Lansing. So he had to take a little road trip and he's out doing that, taking care of his customers. And so that's why he's not on the show. He'll be back next week. So Paco, we basically have been talking about, I've been talking with Dave and he's talking about the things he's doing in his business. And we talked about profit first and basically paying ourselves using an envelope system. I'm assuming you were listening to the podcast when you messaged me and uh, said, hey, can I get in on that? I said, yeah, come on in. Absolutely. On my new Google Home, I was uh, watching it, uh, casting the uh, show as I was doing certain things, and uh, it was a great topic because I was actually talking partly about that with uh, Matt on the uh, other show network I'm on. Nice. Very good. So right now we're kind of talking about – Dave, you just, you were saying that there, there's some things in your business. And I know one of the things you have in your notes is talking about staying hungry in your business. And, and we all have a problem with doing that, those types of things as far as, sure. especially when you're not paying yourself in, in real short story is for years, my wife and I would not take a personal allowance and everybody knows I work a regular job. And the, because we didn't take that personal allowance, we would spend all kinds of money on things just when we want it. Well, it's a little different when you take that personal allowance every week and you're seeing a benefit of you going out into the workforce. And I think it's the same thing with your business. There's a benefit when you have that profit to spend, but when you don't, it becomes a grind. And therefore, because it becomes a grind, a lot of times we're like going, ah, I know I need more business, but do I really want more business? Well, here's the difference. I'm going to sum it up real quick, and I'm going to let Dave run with this. That is, if you are making $10 an hour, it's a grind. Now, if you turn that into a profit of $100 an hour, I would shovel dog poop for $100 an hour. That's how simple that is. Okay? So, Anyways, Dave, you're talking about staying hungry in, you know, in your business. And it, what were some of your thoughts on that? Well, what happened was once I started implementing this a lot more and I see, you know, the envelope concept or the, the partition concept, once my data partition started getting low enough and I started getting those warnings, I'm like, 
I'm not, I mean, I'm making money. I'm generally happy, but I'm not making as much money as I should be because I'm just taking money from one area to another. I'm just shuffling things around. Okay. And it convinced me for the first time to pick up the phone and start calling customers. And I had been so afraid of doing that and making sales calls and it revolutionized my business overnight. And it was just, it was, I got, Hey, it's been a year since we've seen you. How are things running? They'd say, well, actually, I'm glad you called. I'm having this problem. Great. Let's schedule a service call. Everything's running okay? Great. Let's schedule a checkup to make sure it's running that way. And all of a sudden, that money started coming in again and taking a little bit of that profit off the top. I was like, hey, here's my next vacation coming right up. Or Tech Con Unplugged, that's already paid for with that. There you go. Awesome. It, not only that, it's it's a double whammy because you also get to use that as a tax write off for your next year's taxes. That's that's true too. <laughs> it just it just it makes you think more once you start you you start getting too comfortable in your business. I think especially if you've been doing this a while, oh, money's coming in, I'm paying the bills, life is good, but then you just get bored and you get burned out. So by staying hungry, that keeps you more active, and by taking a little bit of that money off the top for the profit, I know every service call I get or every expense I reduce, that's more potential money into the profit, which is my play money, which is the whole reason I'm doing this. Now, Paco, let me ask you, because I know you talked about this on the last episode, or I think it was two episodes back of Tech Life. I can't remember when, but anyways, I, I know you talked about the, uh, you know, just the different things you had to do in your business and the different things that you, thought processes. And I know you're constantly going through this where you're like, Hey, I need to cut expenses over here. I need to add over here. And you've gone through that where it's like, do I really want to do this anymore? So what are your thoughts on the business and on staying hungry in your business and the things that you have to do in order to make that where it's palatable to you to stay in the business and do what you do? Sure. Um, I will say that it is exhausting to have to continue to keep that mindset every day. Um, because that's really what it was, uh, probably from, you know, the middle of 2018 to all the way to probably the last quarter of 2018 around September, October, when I decided to kind of just go all in was the phrase I used. Um, staying hungry can be viewed as different ways. There's can be the view of the passion that you have for your company and for your business and what you're doing for your customers. The other get, uh, being hungry is the, out of the necessity of you will be hungry if you do not do this, you know, and it's to a point where if I don't take care of A, Y, B, and, or A, B, and C, you know, you will not have a place to live. You will not be able to eat, you know, and the stress factor of I cannot continue to keep relying on my, um, my loved ones. I cannot continue to keep relying on, um, you know, your significant other who is supporting you, but you have that mentality of, I have to stay hungry because you have to ensure that they understand that you, you being able to succeed is the repayment of their investment. And that is a continued, uh, mindset that you have to change. Um, similar to what I talked about back in, uh, in tech life, you know, I had that go all in or quit moment that every serious entrepreneur business owner has. And, you know, as the stereotypical story goes, you decide to give yourself a goal and all of a sudden things change, quote unquote, overnight. And because of that, exactly like Dave mentioned, there are things that you don't realize that you needed to do that you should have done that were plain in sight in front of you. Um, the first one being, okay, cross sales and upsells, probably the most easiest thing to obtain revenue for your business. If you have a set of products that you're trying to sell to new customers, why aren't your previous customers on those, especially if they're only one-time customers? If you do not have a portfolio or a list of products that you're offering, you need to start working on it because you cannot develop recurring revenue without products. And by products, I mean bundling your services to look like a product. Um, and that's what we ended up doing, figuring out how to change services to looking that way 
appealing to those and just using the current state of our industry and the environment to be able to track our client or uh, lead our clients to these services so that when you just get that one sale, when you get that one, yes, allows you to want more. And that's how you can try and make sure to continue to stay hungry as you kind of further your path. That's good. And I think a lot of us will forget sometimes too, that we talk about recurring revenue and, and that is a way to do business. And that's, and that's good. And you should be pursuing that to a, a certain percentage depending on what you can handle in your business. I think a lot of times we also forget, and Dave, you alluded to this earlier, that getting in contact with your customer, because we already, everybody has a customer base. You have people that you've done business with. And so you can, here's, here's the thing, here's the reality. Most people have computer problems throughout the year, but either you're forgotten or it's not that important for them to take care of at the time. But here's the thing, you send out an email to your customer base, you send out, uh, you you personally phone call, you, you pick up the phone and actually call these people and you will find a lot of times there is a, a, a good percentage of them that are having problems just at the time when you call. And maybe they've been having problems for, for weeks or months, but now that you've called, hey, yeah, when can I bring it in? And so you're you're keeping that constant flow going and therefore you're, you're staying hungry in the business. Now, I know like, Dave, you said that a lot of people, and yourself included, don't really like to do that. It's kind of a pain. So, I mean, what really changed it for you as far as thinking, I'm going to force myself to do this and call my customers, even though I don't like to? It was the, it was the hungry aspect of it. I didn't do it different than Paco. This was kind of an artificial situation. You know, I had used profit first to show that I had less money in the main bank account because it was going in all the different directions. And I'd see that number go down and I'd be like, I got to get on the ball. I get to get on the ball. I was just like, you know what? I've talked to these people and I said, my rule is I'm going to start calling until I get a yes. And it became easier and easier, three or four calls a day. Um, I looked at my schedule from the year before who I serviced that day and just picked up the phone and called them. I'd maybe reach about half of them. The other half, I'd send emails, and it just kept the, kept me at top of mind with them, and it, it was just it was just amazing. And I would not have done something like that if I didn't feel the need to stop being comfortable with where my business was, because it's just so easy to sit there. The calls come in, life is good. I'm keeping busy, and then it's but am I growing? Am I am I making something sustainable? I don't know, but by cutting out that money, it did. In, in what constitutes busy, you know, watching yeah. cat videos on YouTube is not busy. <laughs> and, and Dave, I'm not accusing you of watching cat videos. I'm just saying that there are things, I don't know, you got, I can get into Facebook, I can get into YouTube videos, yeah. whatever. And it just brings me down this path where I'm like going, where did that last two and a half hours go? What, what just happened to me? And so a lot of times we feel we're busy and I can't remember, I'd heard this somewhere else, but. Somebody mentioned something about keeping track of basically, and it might, might have been on one of the other shows, keeping track of how busy you are or what you're doing. Now, I, I think it was on another podcast, but if you keep track of what you actually do, and there's, I know there's a couple apps out there. They're not coming to my brain right now, but you, if you keep track of what you do on a daily basis and really watch where your time goes. A lot of time is wasted on a daily basis. We all do it, whether you work a job, whether you work for yourself. It's just the nature of doing what we do. Paco, yeah, you're going to talk about that. T O D G L is the app okay. to track what I do. And it actually watches the windows on my computer and everything. Right. Hey, there is an interesting question coming in, and maybe you guys can uh, answer this uh, in the chat room. And this is from uh, Wiggs. He says, uh, says number one, he says, I'm right there. Get it, get all in or get all out. He says, uh, been running a profit since the late 80s. That's a long time. Last two years, I'm losing money. Is it time to quit? It's a good question. And he um, said, I've been sitting, watching my tech stock investments grow for years. Now that it is all over, uh, you know, now what do I do? And uh, J.D. Venice in the chat says, raise your prices. 
So what do you guys say to that as far as, uh, cause we, we, we all get to that point where it's like, we've been doing something so long, we keep doing it the same way. And we go, we always need to make slight adjustments. Right. Yeah. I think the biggest piece is to look at your services, see what you're offering and whichever ones you hate doing, uh, start cutting those and then start focusing on what you like to do and then raise the prices on those. Um, I think if you are able to look at certain avenues of, okay, you know, and I did this last year where, okay, I make, you know, from my hard drive inst- uh, replacement that uh, drive goes bad, I make 250 if they want me to back up the data, 150 if it's just an OS reinstall, uh, fully updated, all that sort of jazz. So if they want to do that, um, then I will go all in on those services. But for example, replacing DC jacks and screens, which take more of my time, which end up I can't do look for business or I can't go out and repair these other ones, then I'll cut those services. So this year I got really more serious on leaving the computer repair side of things and more into the IT businesses. So now on a call by call basis, if I like the person and it sounds like I can build a good rapport, and it falls under one of these services, I'll take that job. But if it sounds like, for example, if someone says, you know, I have a key that's not working, you know, to schedule an appointment for them to come in is not worth my $79 diagnostic fee um, for me to find out that it's a keyboard to be replaced and it's one that has 40 screws behind it, not doing it. <laughs> so, um, so I would basically take a look at that. Um, and if you're losing money, I would take a look at what your expenses are as well. So depending on what the business is doing for, um, as far as what it needs to run, I would take a second look at that and see what are some things that can be cut out that will kind of sting if you really need everything, but it won't really affect your business in the long run as you try to maintain your footing um as you try to wane out what's going on dave what say you yeah i would i would lean a little bit more towards you know the the basics of business is if you're losing money then either your income needs to go up or your expenses need to go down or a combination of both so you know i would look more towards expenses going up and seeing if that's the reason why you're losing money. And that's where we talked about earlier, really this time of year auditing every little dollar. Okay, why am I spending money on that? And I mentioned there's um, apps like Trim that will actually go through your credit card and say, okay, is this a recurring expense that you need to get rid of? I mean, there's silly things we have on our credit cards, like that magazine subscription. Did you subscribe to that? Did you subscribe? Who subscribed to this magazine that we get charged for every year? Um, stuff like that. Things like, I mean, Spotify or Netflix or, or something like that. Where, where are things that we can cut? And then the flip side, I'm a big believer in playing the credit card point game of seeing of those expenses, how could you be doing a better job at making those dollars work for you? Like, you know, I have a credit card that gives me 3% on my uh, internet bill. And, you know, both my telecommunications, both cable bill and um, phone bill. So, hey, that's money working for me. And then looking at like there are certain apps that will take things from, um, you know, price protections um, like Newegg. There's a few like Ernie and, and uh, Paribus that will go in and see if you've overpaid for something on Newegg will automatically get you a refund for that. And these little things here and there, although they're five minute, 10 minute things that we were talking about at the beginning, the one, three, five list, that's something I would put on the five list. Okay. I'm going to spend two minutes and set this up and see, I overpaid for this. And Hey, a couple dollars here, a couple dollars there that goes back into the profit first. It's like, Hey, that's more money. That's a, that's a couple cups of coffee on the next vacation. Makes there a good you go. It does. And it, it's, it's a lot about mindset. You know, one of the things I'm doing is I was using a grasshopper for my VoIP service, basically just an internet calling service that I can use for my business line goes right to my phone and everything. Well, I've got an appointment Tuesday to hook up with freedom voice and talk to Paul over there and, uh, basically get switched over because it's going to save me about 30 bucks in my bill, 30 bucks a month. I mean, you know, can I afford the $30? Yes. Do I need to afford the $30? Probably not because a phone system is going to be a phone system. And plus <clears throat> this is going to be a phone system that I can actually sell to my customers. Those that want VoIP in their offices. So it's, 
it's a win-win situation and just makes sense to not only cut those expenses, learn how to use the system that I'm going to provide to my customers. I did exactly the, the exact same thing. I switched exactly from Grasshopper to Freedom Voice about six months ago. Yep, save a little bit of money and get a lot of added bonus features. Um, I like the routing where one of the things that goes through my Freedom Voice is I have an emergency line uh, that actually got called a little while ago. If you want to call back after hours, it's 25 bucks. And Freedom Voice will text, it will email, it will send me a thousand and one different ways to say this emergency call came in. And yeah, I drop what I'm doing and I give you a call back and it makes you, because it's a, it's a phone tree, it's like if you agree to pay the $25 charge and you would like a call back, press five. Someone called it and she was panicked and I'm going to see you later today, but that was a quick, easy 25 bucks for doing a phone call. And I could do that with Grasshopper, but it was a lot harder. Freedom Voice made it super easy. Phone trees are a beautiful thing. Um, so I actually, it's funny that uh, we're talking about switches from VoIP. I actually switched back to my previous uh, VoIP provider. So I had, I was with 8x8 for five and a half years. And then I switched to Vonage, which was a terrible mistake. But I ended up doing it because Vonage could integrate with um, Repair Shopper at the time, or Synchro. Um, but not only did it cost me a little bit more money on a lot of more of the things I, they could not figure out two options. One, uh, transferring to my answering service, there was uh, two rings and it would drop the call, which is terrible because if I can't pick up the phone, they're essentially my call center. And then the second issue I ran into is every time I call out, my caller ID would not come out with my company name. And they've troubleshooted, they've tried to figure this out. They couldn't, I don't know what was going on. But basically, there was a client that apparently was not picking up my calls specifically because for three weeks, because my name did not display on the caller ID. So they let the calls go. I switched, everything switched back Friday. When I called, they picked up. I took care of the job yesterday and finally got paid because of that switch. So that just tells you one looking at those line items because when they say it's cheaper sometimes you kind of get it in the end but at the same time by me switching back to what was working and again phone uh, phone tree is a beautiful thing now i was able to take care of what i needed to take care of as well let's uh we're going to take a quick break and then uh, there's a couple more things in the chat room i want to touch on and then we'll uh we'll kind of finish the rest of this discussion we still got time so uh we're not in any hurry or anything like that our show today is brought to you by FreshBooks. Small business owners, it's time to be honest about how you feel when dealing with your day-to-day -day admin work. It sucks. Uh, <laughs> I'm saying that. Admit it. You can't stand it. It's a total grind. Yeah, it sucks. Uh, the truth is over 5 million small business owners felt exactly the same way until they discovered FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the dead simple cloud accounting software that's transforming how small businesses handle their paperwork. You have invoicing. Use FreshBooks to create and send an invoice. Literally takes about 30 seconds. There's no formulas or formatting. Just perfectly crafted invoices every time. Online payments. Your clients can pay you online, which, me, which often means you end up getting paid a lot faster. It's true. Instead of waiting for that check, man, you get, uh, get paid online and it's instant there. Uh, project deposits. There's a super handy deposit feature so you can invoice for a payment upfront when you're kicking off a project. Want to get paid for that hardware up front before you uh, actually put in that big order so you're not sitting there holding it, right? Uh, insights. FreshBooks can show you whether or not a client has looked at the invoice you've emailed. This is only a fraction of what FreshBooks can do for you. You owe it to yourself to feel the full effect of FreshBooks on you and your small business. For a 30-day free trial, just go to freshbooks.com forward slash podnuts. Enter podnuts in the how did you hear about us section. All right, so one of the questions that's going on in the chat room is um, uh, Wiggs is talking about running on a shoestring uh, budget, basically rent, utilities, minimal inventory. And they're talking about some of the inventory, you know, having certain things in inventory. And here's retail is weird, and everybody knows that things are changing. You, if you want to go into, if you need something, you want to go into a Best Buy or even a computer store nowadays, the, the pickings, there are usually very slim like you can have a 20 dollar usb cable or you can have a 100 dollar hdmi cable etc cetera, etc cetera, or a you know a, a 50 dollar mouse 
Um, I know a couple of the guys in the industry have always talked about in their retail shops, whether here or Canada, a lot of times they will only pull in inventory that they can turn around. And I, I think it's like, it's like a three, I want to say 200 to 300% markup on these items. That's the only time that they go. This is the only time that it's worth it to sell X amount of th this stuff that people need in. So it was, it's a lot more inexpensive stuff that people will need to pick up on the fly that, you know, you have available right then and now. And as far as the rent goes, man, I, it goes back to a lot of people will run their businesses out of a small office. I know Paco, you do this or even out of your own home, depending on your, your comfort level there. Um, it, it's hard when that, when that stuff's out there. Now there are people who are right now starting up businesses and they are paying rent but usually they have a good a good deal with somebody where they've gotten you know a, a fair amount of rent but what i've seen around this area is i've seen a lot of rent who they see you know the owner the landlord sees that the the company's making money and all of a sudden they're like going well i can make more money and they start upping their rent all of a sudden you're like really but they have no idea exactly what your margins and stuff are. So I see a lot of that. It's, it, it is frustrating. Um, there's nine ways to skin a cat and not that I'm about skinning cats. I'm just saying, but there, there's many ways to get this done. Right. So it, it's really talking about stepping back, looking at go, you know, look at your books. These, that's exactly what these guys are talking about. Look at your books, see what's selling see what where your profits are coming from and concentrate on that and i'm, I'm going to differ with you paco just a little bit I, i'm in agreement with you do things that you like to do but if you have a high profit margin in something that you do and even though you don't really care to do it as long as it's a high profit margin again remember for a hundred dollars an hour i would shovel dog poop then i would be perfectly fine with that bleep that <laughs> i would basically say that if you are going to do something with a high margin you can hire somebody else to do it and get a little piece of the margin if you want to do it that way i like but, that even better that's but, good like you said i mean i no i i can't no i've just my time for me in my life i've always valued time more than money so if this if i'm there like perfect example i was looking at this stupid dell that i was trying to figure out how am i going to install this ssd I bought these brackets. I thought I bought the wrong brackets. <clears throat> I went ahead and looked at it. I'm going through. I mean, I spent literally an hour messing with the, the stupid, you know, that blue uh, uh, casing that it has with the regular hard drives that you slide into the certain yeah, slot. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out how do I do this? What is going on? So I finally just stopped, looked at the case and realized that they've now fitted the metal frames to fit SSDs with four screws without the without the uh that blue bracket so i flung the thing installed it was done in 20 <laughs> minutes so it was one of those where it's like when i waste my time on something dumb like that i get frustrated so when it comes to like uh things like replacing screens and things like that if it's not a big you know i've had two screens for whatever reason i'll take it apart put the lcd cable back in and all of a sudden the lcd cable starts sparking no clue why uh so i've just decided to sell the whole displays or the the lcd comes they gotta buy the cable too if i don't need the cable i return the cable and refund the portion of it that i charged them for the cable and they just asked like hey i just saw you know what turned out the uh item actually was a lot cheaper within the last 30 days we decided to get you a little bit of your money back and that's how i do it because i just have been tired of dealing with things that waste my time for that type of thing but going back to what wigs is talking about and there's a lot of it going back and forth on what he should do and in inventory um i do what a lot of the guys are saying in the uh in the chat room is i order my inventory if unless it's a, like i know i'm going to get ssds replaced or hard drives replaced so i'll get a, a couple of those stocked or a power supply um but other than that i don't buy anything else even if it, there is a good deal unless i need it i won't buy it now if he has 10 years worth of inventory that he just can't use i personally think you should call see look up metal scrappers that will pay you money for the metal and just haul all of that get some cash into there and infuse that into your business um, I know those are rare nowadays, but there are some that are still around. 
grab all that junk and try and get a little bit of cash and put that into for your own uh, revenue sake. So I'd say as far as, you know, the inventory issue, I'm, I'm with you, Paco. I order everything pretty much real time. And not only do I make money a little bit off the profit, but between, you know, Ebates and between all, you know, credit card points and stuff like that, I'm making five to 7%, even if I charge the actual price that I paid on Amazon. Um, cause I get Amazon points and I get whole food points, I get all these other points going back and forth. And there's this app I have called drop that gives me an extra point on top of my credit card points. Um, it works out great. Um, as far as stale inventory, my secret is, um, if something got misordered, if I made a mistake, if someone changed their mind, if I'm stuck with it, I've had for the longest time, I had an IDE, um, uh, laptop hard drive. And what I work with is I have a organization that does computer refurbishing called Connecting for Good in town. And they will refurbish computers for low income families. I donate to, to them. I mark off the price I paid for it. So all of a sudden I get a deduction. I get a little bit of a feel good movement taking picture here. Look at me donating all this computer stuff. Oh, it just happens to be stuff I can't return at this point. But it's win-win for everyone because they need those older parts to refurbish older computers. Well, and that's the thing too. I mean, even when you're buying these parts, even if you're stuck with them, as far as a tax deduction, that's going to go against you. It's going to go in your favor anyways, as far as that, hey, I order a part, it could sit on my shelf for a hundred years. I'm going to take the one-time tax deduction for it, whatever. It's not, it's not that big a deal. But yeah, when you can actually put it where you're, you're helping somebody out. That's definitely a better scenario. Um, I, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's tough out there. Uh, there's, I think there's just different ways of looking at your business and finding out kind of your niche in the market and what it is you want to do and how you want to do it. You know, Paco for the, the laptop screens or whatever. I mean, I like those cause they're, they're pretty dead simple. Even some of the newer ones with the touch screens because they're all coming in all enclosed. They're not too bad, um, especially in the business class line. But a lot of times what I've always done, hard drives or screens, et cetera, I will find kind of where most screens are. Let's say a screen costs, I don't know, $40. And back in the day, they, were, they would cost $100 or whatever. Let's say they cost $40. Now, some of them might cost a little bit more than that, or maybe a cable will cost me an extra $10. So I'm going to charge $80 for that screen. Now, these are just round numbers, and this is stuff I make up in my head. It just makes sense to me. So every time I do a screen, it doesn't matter what type of screen it is. If I, if I look and I save a little bit of money on that, that's fine. But I'm going to throw that cable in there anyways. If the cable doesn't need to be replaced because everything's working fine, that's fine. But here's the other caveat to that too. Let's say everything is working fine. I've had this happen. And then you go and you give the computer back and somebody, and it's, it's working for a minute. And then all of a sudden they go, Hey, there's a, it, this flickering again on me. What's going on? And you come back and go, yeah, apparently I didn't bend the cable enough to make sure that it was bad. So there's a couple things you could do. Just swap it out, do a straight swap out, or you could just replace the cable every time with the screen and call it a done deal. That's probably the easiest thing to do. And then just charge whatever you're going to charge, uh, you know, bump it up a little bit. So here's the thing. On some things, even if you charge a flat rate on some of those, you come up with that median value, you'll lose on some, you'll gain on others, but in the end, the profit overall will be more. It's just kind of the way it works out. It's, it's, there's no, it's not a dead set formula. It's just how it works out. So yeah. um, that's something you can definitely think about. And the biggest piece is, like you said, is, I, and I cannot stress enough, is the upsells. Someone comes into you with a bad hard drive and you can't recover the data. You put you to try and partner with like a carbonite or you partner with a Magnus box or you partner with somebody that, you know, is a good partner for you for cloud backup. And you will go ahead and basically upsell them and you do it at the time of when all of this is happening with the pain point because you're less likely to close as you get it resolved and they ha they're happy go lucky and go from there. But especially if they've lost the data, you need to explain to them, this is, there is a way to prevent this from happening again. This is a solution. I really suggest you take this, um, you know, and if it's something like, you know, again, a carbonite 
or, or um, a Magnus box, you can subscribe to their partner program, get a little bit of a discount for what they offer and charge what you like to charge or charge what they're charging. So like Carbon I, I think it's like a 15% or 20% um, uh, margin that you can get from their retail price. Um, you know, other cloud providers, they charge you a simple fee and you just upcharge on that fee, which is what I do. Um, so it's just, you know, one of those where it's these little things that start shifting, st that start really working. Um, and that's something that I would suggest too, is just no, don't only solely focus on what the issue is, focus on the whole problem and see how you can help that customer with that whole problem. I like that. That's very good. Totally. Now, now Dave, I want to come back to you and we, we're talking about profit first. We're talking about staying hungry in the industry, doing the things that you need to do. Is there any other thoughts that you had on this particular topic that we have not covered yet that you want to talk about? I think I think we really covered the the, the key points, which is to really be thinking about, you know, begin with the end in mind, that idea of before you do anything, put some money aside for yourself. For for not not just a salary for yourself, but actual money to put aside, and then work your way back, so that way you can reduce your expenses, a, increase your income, and and really try to track that. Again, I'm not going to be looking at a profit and loss statement for my account. I'm going to be looking at okay, do I have money in the bank? And by separating out those bank accounts and putting in partitions, it's going to be a lot clearer that you don't have money to pay your taxes, or you don't have money to pay this advertising bill, or something like that. But otherwise, I think I think we pretty much covered it all. I mean, I had some ideas as far as kind of saving money on expenses and and try to play those games with credit cards and stuff like that. But yeah, I try to negotiate every bill. You know, one thing that we didn't talk about, I would say, with software and and and, and Paco reminded me, um, you shouldn't be as a consultant, which is what we are in many ways. You shouldn't be paying for software. You should be trying to contact these companies. Say, hey, listen, I'm going to be recommending this program. Um, would you give me a free license for it, an NFR or some kind of partner program? So I don't pay for my backup. Like you had mentioned the Freedom Voice, you know, you shouldn't have to pay retail for something like that as part of their partner program. These are little bills you can negotiate and make a win. And then every time you negotiate those bills, that's going into um, more of your profit. That means you're going to have more fun in life. I like that. That's very good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, exactly like he said, you know, there's so many and that's and that's all about standardizing, right? It's figuring out <clears throat> what are you going to offer? What are you going to try and do as far as um, specifically on your offerings? Are you going to get into the firewall business? Are you going to get into getting to uh, recurring revenue? Are you going to fix your recurring revenue that you have right now? Because, you know, some of us had that issue. I had the issue where I was charging annually for my uh, recurring revenue. And that was great to get a three grand check or a four grand check for certain of my clients, but it was only one time out of the year. So in, I've always been the believer that cash flow will always be the bottleneck of your business, not making money. So once I made that switch from being annual to monthly, I noticed things were a little bit easier. Things were a little bit nicer. Things a little bit wasn't as bad. And I was even, I forgot who I was talking to. They asked me, how are things going um, for the business? And November, December um, in 2017 was really rough from actually from September to December. And this year I felt a slight pinch, but not as bad as I did the year before because I made those slight adjustments and it's all about the slight adjustments um, and exactly like Dave mentioned. So I've decided now that whenever somebody mentions that they have a bad, uh, they're having uh, modem issues or Comcast box is acting up, I'm telling them, okay, if it's a residential client, get a modem only box. We're putting an untangled box home for you. And this is a month, a yearly subscription, but guess what? It's going to be better for you. And you don't have to worry about the big bad guys trying to get in if it's one of the uh, higher customers. If it's for my business clients, started going that route, making sure I push back up and making sure that a lot of my monthly services have these line items, being able to control a lot of these specific settings of my users because I have a lot of clients that bring in BYOD devices, now start working on implementing Jump Cloud. And I can charge that as a service because my clients don't know how to handle that. And there's a lot of those certain things that you can try and figure out. Um, but to kind of bring it back to Dave, 
Um, my question for you is by implementing profit first, because I'm doing a similar thing as well, trying to pay myself and, and, and things like that. How have you set up your structure to do the portfolio or did I happen to miss that in the first half of the uh, show? Now, did you open up two checking accounts and one savings accounts and you put X, Y, and Z on these three? How have you decided to partition that work best for you? And how are you paying yourself? Uh, well, it's it's weird. I I haven't done it to, I, I think a lot of times when you read these books, you get, you get the nuances, but you may not follow it exactly. Sure. Having a whole bunch of accounts didn't make sense to me. What I try to do is to focus more on credit cards. Okay. So recurring expenses go on one credit card. Inventory goes on another. Um, and then I have a checking account, a savings account, and then my don't touch account, which is the, the profit first account. That's where um, the, the fun money comes in. Um, and these are your business accounts, not your own personal accounts. Right. Okay. Right. Right. So that that seemed to work for me because what I started noticing was because all those bills got paid out of the main account. I was like, these numbers are going down. Um, I'm really beginning to see the credit card bill going up. So my goal, and I pay my credit card bills every month, but my goal has been to reduce the expenses, keep those credit card bills down and see the main bank account go up. That's the way I've looked at it. That's not doing profit first to the level that Mike McCall would suggest, but it's just getting this better idea. Before I read this, it was like, okay, everything went into this main account. Okay, the main account's getting money. It's going up. That's good. But, oh, wait a minute. And then I get this big bill come in, and now it's gone down, and I never really had a feel for it until I met with the accountant, and she said, you didn't make as much money last year. I'm like, I didn't? Really? I'm like, oh. Or, yeah, and again, being a sole proprietor, we're looking at the big picture. She's like, your business didn't make as much money, but your investments are doing great. But, oh, you have to pay more taxes on the investments now. So... Um, yeah, so that's kind of the way I've done it. I haven't quite figured it out totally, but the the thing that I got away was to pay attention to things on a monthly basis closely by looking at that bank account. And when I saw that bank account going down, it's made me get on the phone and make calls to sell more stuff and reduce my expenses. And man, the selling, like you said, the upselling, I get to the point now where I don't even, when it's a hard drive or something, I don't even really give them the option of, hey, do you want to do backup? I just say, I assume you want to set up a backup system so this doesn't happen again, right? No, how much is that? Well, it's $50 a year, um, which is less than what you just paid me now, which I'm fine either way. Go ahead. Pay me to recover you know. your data every year. I'm, I'm, I'm talking myself out of money here, but yeah, do, do, do what you want. Yeah, pay me now or pay me later. <laughs> yeah, and I will have them actually sign this happen. We had a bunch of clients on Thursday where we'll have them, do, when they do the service order, we have on there declined backup and put their initials. Mm, okay. So they know it's serious. And sure enough, someone came back and said, well, I didn't realize I'd lose my data this soon. I'm sorry, hard drives fail. We, 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 we talked about this backup. I see you want it now. I'll think about it. All right. People wanna... don't learn. Yeah. I think uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I hear you on that one. I had a client that <clears throat> similar issue happened. You know, we put her on a trial for a, the, a bit of it because it was her warranty for the virus removal. Hey, do you want to go on it? No, because I only came in to replace the keyboard. Said no, you replaced the keyboard and you had a virus removed. Um, you really should have this on. No, I'm okay. All right, 30 days later. Hey, my system is all gunked up. I was like, Well, you know, we took off the, the system, whatever. And she's like, Oh, that's what you meant. Okay, I'll give you a call <laughs> if I think about it. You know, and it's you know, people don't learn. Um, but going back to as far as like how the accounts are set up, so I have a similar setup where more on the account. So I have three accounts for my business, one account for myself, and one account for my savings. So Two, pers two accounts on my personal, three on my business. One, all the money funnels in, and then whatever um, uh, processing fees get pulled out of there. Second account handles all my um, all of my uh, expenses that go for the business that are recurring. And then the savings handles all my tax and my uh, profits that end up lying in that um, savings account as well. But what I've also used because I've been burned a couple times by vendors pulling out money when they weren't supposed to 
is a app called Token, T-O-K-E-N. And what this app does, it generates credit card numbers linked to your debit card. And you can set the amount of money that is supposed to be charged on those individual cards. So if a bill is only supposed to be X amount of dollars, only that amount of money should go through on those cards. If for some reason it goes over, it declines. And it's not like where if you have recurring uh, revenue or recurring charges where you can freeze the card for certain moments and the charges still go through. Um, in this case, if it's above or going through, you can maintain a standard of what your charges are going to be. And if something goes over, at least you now know and it doesn't affect your cash flow. So it's I've just started working with them probably in the last month or so. Um, so far, it's worked really well um, and it helps keep my expenses on a, on a um to maintain what's going on. But on the other part too, it really helps out on just understanding what's coming out of your accounts. And the support team has been great working with them because we had a couple of times where I tried a little bit of their things, um, but it's worked out really well. So from those three accounts, I'll run payroll from where the expense accounts goes. And then I'll run payroll through QuickBooks payroll, which is a one-time fee I pay, I think it's like 79 bucks a month or something like that. And I just pay myself once a month through that. Let them take care of the taxes, let them take care of everything from there. And then um, I will be working with a company, which we didn't, I know you talked about this earlier about putting in for social security, putting in for investments, putting in for retirement. Um, it may be beneficial to you <clears throat> as far as you and the audience is to look into a company that's an all around HR company. And these all around HR companies usually are a one flat fee, but they will take care of all of those human resource ish things. So, you know, investing in a financial company like uh, the one I'm going to go with is uh, I think it's Cognos is the one um, that I've been looking at that works with the chamber and hundred bucks an employee from the business. And what it does is it gains you access to WinTrust, which is the bank they use for 401k. You're working with Humana for insurance, working for, and then they take care of and go through all that process versus you having to negotiate these rates with these individual things you need to do, retirement, insurance, stuff like that. So I just use Cognos as an example, but there are others out there like Next Step and uh, Insisperity and others similar to those. Um, there should be some of those type of companies in your areas, but they provide a low level entry for smaller companies to gain access to smaller discounts for those that are trying to, you know, get back to how you used to have things when you used to work a W-2 and a, um, in corporate America. Okay. All right. So what I want you guys to do is I want you to gather your lasting thoughts and we're going to take a quick break <clears throat> and do a, uh, a quick uh, support ad here. <laughs> and that is if you'd like to support this show, I would encourage you to go to patreon.com forward slash computer repair podcast. Our newest Patreon supporters, we have JT and James Tomasello. And I want to thank all of our current uh, Patreon supporters for your continued support. It's wonderful that people feel that they're getting a lot out of this show and they're showing their support. Uh, two gentlemen that are on the panel right now show us their support every month, and we definitely appreciate that. It's a bucket show. Four or $5 a month. I mean, again, you know, write it off in your taxes because you, you're getting information, education to help you in your business. And then the other thing, too, is you're going to get access to a secret Facebook group where you're going to see nice people. They're very nice because the reason they're so nice is because if they're not nice, my boys, they will kick them out. <laughs> and we wanted a place where in, in kind of, this is the best way to do it. In my opinion is that you charge a little bit, but you get access to a lot more. You're getting more than what, what, you know, a lot of times these groups would cost a lot of money. This is a little bit of money and it gives you access to come in ask a question. It doesn't matter how simple it is. It doesn't matter if it's a, if it's a new, uh, you know, question that has been answered 5,000 times. It doesn't matter. There's always somebody there that's going to answer the question to steer you in the right direction, kind of give you a good answer, or even be able to collaborate on things to where you can benefit yourself and the person that you're you're chatting with. So again, just a safe environment. Yes, we use Facebook. The reason is, is because most people are on Facebook. 
it's just the way it is. So anyways, if you'd like to do that, go over to patreon.com forward slash computer repair podcast and sign up today. And once you do that, all you got to do is you can send me a friend request on Facebook. I will accept that and put you right into the group. So it's that simple. All right. So Dave, I'm going to go with you. Any lasting thoughts about some of the topics and things we talked about today or anything that you want to add? I would say just make it a go. Um, find some expense in your business and say, I'm going to reduce it this week. I'm going to find out a way to reduce it by even 5 to 10%. And remember that 5 10% is going to be your fun money and it's going to pay off for you. Awesome. Great advice. And Paco, any lasting thoughts from you? I want one task for everyone to do is try and free up, if you're in a residential field, free up $39 a month. Try and cut services to gain $39. If you're in the businesses, try and free up $49. Once you figure out what services you can close that are not working for you and go from there, I want you to then go over to TechNibble and sign up for the white label newsletters because we know that we talked about being front of mind. Bryce does a very good job of being able to sign up for those newsletters, throw them into MailChimp, upload your clients, schedule them one hour out of every month and let them go every week, keep top of mind. And guess what? From those, you will be still top of mind and that will allow and help you with your phone calls to those clients because you're taking an investment to them and making sure that they understand they're getting it valued, they're getting information and so forth. Now, <clears throat> if you have a little bit more in your uh, profits and your revenue, and you're really trying to stay st uh, um, top frame of mind, then you hit up my boy, Matthew Rodello for uh, tech blog builder, or if you're a tech site builder client, which you should be, then you can get on his blog building platform and that can help you build out some really great content custom to your system and to your business to gain some real good clients that way. But try and figure out what you can do from there. You wanna be front of mind for your customers. This is the easiest and best way to do it. Take an hour of every month to do so and just send them out. You'll be surprised on how many clients reply back thinking that it's you sending those emails and how many jobs you'll go ahead and close. I, you will close at least one or two if you make the effort to follow up and reach out to these clients. And for a lot of people, you know, one or two extra customers, again, a lot of times you can turn these into recurring customers. And so it's the long-term game that pays off, you know, in the end. So that's, that's really what you got to think about. It's not just the one-offs. Remember the world is basically based on who, you know, if you think about any of the jobs that you've ever gotten in your entire life, uh, whether working for somebody else or, you know, even getting into this industry, a lot of times it's, it's by who, you know. And so it's no different than that with what Paco was talking about. Keep that in front of mind. Keep that out there so people understand uh, who you are. And a lot of times they'll all of a sudden go, hey, I know you helped me with this. Can you help me do this now? And so it kind of keeps that flow going. And it's the gift that keeps on giving. All right. With that, I think we are, have, we, we've done a lot in this show. So this, is, this has been great. Uh, you know, I, I forever try to shorten these shows, but when I have two intelligent gentlemen on to talk about what they're passionate about and bring all these great ideas and, and Dave, thank you also for bringing the, the ideas as far as uh, the topic for the show and talking about this stuff. So Dave, I'm going to, I'm going to kick it off to you and let people know where they can find you at. Well, I'm on, as you say, the Facebook, I'm in the secret Facebook group. Um, website is called drdavekc.com on Twitter. I'm called DR Dave, and that's where to find me. Awesome, man. Appreciate it. And Mr. Paco LeBron, thank you for popping in and, uh, taking John's spot there. Um, no, you, you know, you've always had your own spot anytime that you like. So let people know where they can find you with all the wonderful things that you're doing on the interwebs. Sure. So we have uh, Tech Life over on the Pondas Network. Uh, I, 
I'm trying to keep it consistent again every Tuesday um, that it will be released. I am also on every, well, which will be every other Thursday after this Thursday over at the Computer Business Marketing Show with Matthew Rodella. And you can find me and all the other great podcasters at the TechCon Unplugged in uh, September. Awesome, man. Appreciate that. Come join us live for the Computer Repair Podcast every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern over at podnets.com forward slash CRP live. Join in on the conversation by hanging out in the chat room. You can send an email to podnets at podnets.com or you can leave a voicemail at 734-335-1000. I want to thank everyone for listening and subscribing to the show. We'll see you next time on the Computer Repair Podcast.